following lecture was produced by Glorian Publishing, a nonprofit organization, and is one of hundreds of lectures freely available via download, podcasts, streaming radio, and transcription. These lectures range in topic and complexity in order to address the many needs of humanity. We invite you to browse our library of lectures, books, courses, and articles to find teachings that suit you. Through the support of donations, Glorian Publishing has published 40 books, hosts international retreats several times a year, offers free online courses, and many other valuable resources, available to anyone worldwide. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Your donations make it possible for this free public service to reach thousands of people every day. To make a tax-deductible donation in any amount, even anonymously, visit GnosticTeachings.org. Now, with heartfelt wishes for the end of suffering for all creatures, we begin the lecture. May all beings be happy. In today's lecture, we're going to continue talking about Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. We have covered, in the previous six lectures, the first few steps of Ashtanga, or Raja Yoga. Raja means royal, and Ashtanga means eight-limbed. And that yoga is the king or the royalty of, of the yogas, the embodiment or the repository of the greatest treasures of yoga, and that's why it's called royal. And in this course, we are advancing steadily through the eight limbs of yoga in order to understand how to achieve in our own experience the state of yoga. That word yoga means union, and it refers to a state of consciousness, which is depicted in this image. It is a state of ecstasy, a state of bliss, happiness, a state of purity, in which the consciousness is unconditioned, free of defects, and perceiving its true nature experiencing what it really is. So yoga is not a theory. Yoga is not a school. It is not even a tradition. It is a state of being. And as a state that can be experienced, it relies on cause and effect. One cannot access yoga or understand yoga or experience yoga simply by believing in it or by mechanically repeating certain types of exercises, or adopting beliefs and theories and ways of behavior. Yoga is experienced when we remove the conditions that prevent it. So the eight limbs that are explained by Patanjali in the Yoga Sutras, and that are explained by Sri Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, are about how to remove the conditions that prevent the consciousness from experiencing its true nature. This is a really critical, fundamental point of view to understand about yoga. Let me rephrase it in a simple way. Yoga is not about adopting things. It is about shedding them. Yoga is not about adopting something different or taking on something new. It is about getting rid of what limits you. It is about removing the conditions that prevent you from seeing your true nature. That fundamental difference must be understood if you want to really understand what yoga is. And that experience is due to cause and effect, not belief. When we establish the causes, the effect naturally happens. Not by force, but simply because of nature. So when we remove the conditions that prevent us from experiencing yoga, yoga happens by itself. It's effortless because the consciousness itself 
has its pure, primordial, inherent nature, which is that blissful state that's represented in this painting with this woman touching her heart. But her eyes are, of course, looking towards the heavens, towards the innermost, towards Atman, Brahma. And that experience is what is called in yoga, samadhi. And again, it cannot be forced, it cannot be faked, it cannot be demanded, it cannot be bought. It occurs spontaneously on its own when the conditions that prevent it are removed. So yoga is about removing conditions, not adding them, removing conditions. So that's what we've explained in the previous six lectures. The fundamental steps of how to remove conditioning so that the consciousness can be free to experience its nature, its truth. So the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali begin the first four sentences of the scripture. Now instruction in union. Yoga is the stilling of the modifications of consciousness. Then awareness abides in its own nature. Otherwise, it is identified with the modifications. We emphasize these first four lines in every one of these lectures because these first four sentences express the purpose of yoga. Yoga is the stilling of the modifications, the removal, the cessation, the ending, the quieting. And when we remove or still the modifications of the consciousness, then that awareness, the consciousness itself, can experience its true nature, which is blissfulness, happiness, joy, wisdom, intelligence, serenity, and union with divinity. If we don't achieve the removal of those conditions, then we remain identified with the modifications. That is our state now, all of us. We do not experience the true nature of the consciousness. We do not perceive directly right now the truth and reality of divinity. We have theories about it. We have beliefs about it. A lot of cherished beliefs. But yoga is not about beliefs. It is about perceiving reality. So all of us right now are conditioned. We are identified with modifications. The most obvious one is the physical body. We believe that this body is our identity. We are completely identified with it. We do not realize that the body is just a shell, impermanent, temporary, illusory. We are very much identified with the body. We are identified with emotions, with thoughts, with beliefs, with theories, with behaviors, with music, with art, with thousands upon thousands upon thousands of modifications that filter our perception of reality. We think that they're all real, but they are not. The fundamental reality is what lies deep in the heart of our perception, which is the consciousness itself, when it is unmodified. So yoga is about recognizing those modifications and freeing ourselves from them. The Yoga Sutras explain that. We've discussed in the previous lectures these three first steps, yama, niyama, and asana. Yama and niyama in synthesis are about ethics. They're about behavior. If we behave in certain ways, we cause consequences to occur. They're unavoidable. If we have anger, it produces suffering. There's no way to avoid that. If we have lust, it produces suffering. This is a law of nature. It's just that way. Fear causes suffering. Pride causes suffering. Envy causes suffering. All of these modifications of consciousness cause suffering. And all the scriptures explain these facts to us and have been explaining them for thousands of years, and we still don't get it. Yama and Niyama are about 
learning to restrain behaviors that harm ourselves and others, and learning to adopt behaviors that benefit ourselves and others. And honestly, most people who study yoga ignore yama and niyama. They completely ignore it. Which means that they can never understand what yoga truly is. Most of the people who claim to study yoga want to learn asanas, postures, how to position the body in different ways, how to do stretches, how to become fit and limber, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that in itself. But that does not awaken consciousness. That does not liberate consciousness. That only exercises the physical body. The consciousness is liberated when the conditions that afflict it are removed. And that is a psychological process, not a physical one. So that's what we were explaining in the previous lectures. We've now reached pranayama. These first four steps have a purpose, which is to remove the conditions that afflict the consciousness. Yama and niyama, which are the ethics, proper behaviors, are about changing those behaviors that cause the mind and body to be in a state of suffering, to be in tension, to be afflicted with anxiety, with fear, with desire. Yama and Niyama, when applied, instead of allowing the animal mind to pursue its desires, the consciousness takes charge and says, no, that anger will only cause me to suffer and others to suffer. So I'm going to restrain that. And instead, I'm going to act in a compassionate way. I'm going to dominate that anger, that pride, that lust, that envy, and instead act consciously, sacrificing my desires and self-interests for the greater good. And when we do that, the conditions that limited the free consciousness are lessened and that free consciousness is able to express itself. And when we're able to act and do good, we have peace. We feel serenity. We feel connected with our soul, no longer driven by anger and lust and pride and envy, no longer mastered by our desires and enslaved by our addictions, but instead taking charge of them conquering them. That sets up a process where the consciousness becomes stronger. It starts to become stable. It starts to become serene, free of its guilt and remorse. That way, when we start to do our spiritual practice to meditate, we take our posture, our asana, we're already starting to become calm because we're not behaving in harmful ways. We're conquering those harmful behaviors that disturb the mind, that disturb the body, that disturb our heart. We're starting to do what's right. And when you do what's right, you feel it, you know it. It gives you peace, it gives you serenity. So these steps, as you can see, are about calming, settling, becoming still, becoming relaxed, withdrawing from the external world and going to the internal world. In the third step, asana, the posture, this is where we take our posture for meditation. And in this posture, the prerequisite is to be relaxed. If we are addicted to a desire, we really want some money, we really want sex, we really want power, we really want a job, we really need something, then our mind is very agitated, our heart is very agitated, and our body is very tense and agitated. That means we cannot relax on any level. That means we'll never be able to meditate, not in that state. So these first three steps are really critical if you wanna learn how to meditate. You cannot skip them. We have to learn how to do what's right, and when we find that we've done something wrong, correct it and learn to relax. So you see in this first two steps, self-restraint and precepts, these are about becoming aware of oneself. 
becoming conscious of our behaviors, not only physically, but psychologically. And the third one is about becoming aware of the body, letting it relax, letting it become still. A good posture for meditation is one in which we can be very relaxed, upright, and perfectly still without any pain, without any discomfort, so that the consciousness can do its work. So pranayama, which is the fourth step of yoga, builds on that foundation. Pranayama cannot work if we are not observing yama and niyama, ethical behaviors, and if we are not relaxed. If we are continuing with our former behaviors, indulging in lust and anger and pride and envy, we will never be able to meditate and we will never be able to properly perform a pranayama. We won't be able to relax. So meditation will be out of the question, impossible. Because you see, the rest of the stages of yoga, pratyahara, dharana, dhyana, and samadhi, go deeper and deeper until we access the true nature of the consciousness within us. All of these steps are about removing conditions. Yama and niyama are about removing bad behavior, psychological conditions that cause the mind and body to be disturbed. Asana is about settling the body and relaxing it so much that we can forget it. So the body is no longer an obstacle. It's no longer a condition. The consciousness can leave it. Pranayama goes even deeper. It's about stilling the breath, stilling the energy, making all of the energy in us calm, still, so that it doesn't condition the consciousness either. And then we go to Pratyahara, where we withdraw from the senses completely. And it's only then that we start to access real concentration, dharana. So you'll note right here, if you've tried to meditate and you've not been able to concentrate, it may be because your mind is too active and disturbed, your heart is too active and disturbed, or your body is too active and disturbed. That means all of those conditions were causing the consciousness to be identified. That's why you can't meditate. If you learn to extract the consciousness from all those conditions, concentration is very easy. It's a matter of setting up the foundations in your daily life. About pranayama, the Yoga Sutras has two important sentences. The first one's in the first chapter. It says, peace of mind comes by exhalation and retention of breath. And in the second chapter, after securing that steadiness of posture, follows regulation of breath or control of prana, the cessation of inhalation and exhalation. If you've studied yoga, you've studied tantra, you've studied these types of traditions, you've undoubtedly heard of pranayama or kundalini yoga. And there are hundreds upon hundreds of techniques called pranayama. Generally, they involve breathing exercises, sometimes with mantras, sometimes with alternating nostrils. But pranayama really is not about breath. It's about prana. It's about energy. It's about stilling the energy, making it calm, making it stable. This scripture says, peace of mind comes by exhalation and retention of breath. That word breath there is prana. Prana can be interpreted as breath but it also can be interpreted as energy, life energy. And the second sentence says, after securing the posture, follows regulation of breath or control of prana, the cessation of inhalation and exhalation. Why does it say cessation? If you've studied yoga, you've heard of these, these breathing exercises where people do very rapid breathing exercises and they make a lot of noise and Maybe they're singing mantras, chanting mantras along with it. 
and they make a lot of bodily movements, and it can be quite vigorous. But this says cessation, stilling. So this is not about what most people say is pranayama. To understand that we need to know what prana is. The word prana really just means energy. But it, because of its great flexibility as a term in Sanskrit, it can mean many things. Breath, breath of life, vitality, life force, wind. So everybody who studies yoga talks about prana, and they always talk about it in regards with nature. And it's true. Nature is prana. But so are you. Everything that we are is prana. We are just energy in different modifications. Even Einstein said, there is no matter. There is only energy. So when we're working with yoga, we're really learning to work with energy. The question is, what is our goal? What are we aiming to achieve? If we really want to experience what yoga truly is, which is the experience of the true nature of the consciousness, that is unity with divinity. And we don't experience it now because we are so heavily conditioned by our many desires, that karmic baggage that we carry because of our former mistaken actions. We don't experience our true nature because of our own mistakes. If we want to change that, we need a lot of energy. Just think about this logically. How many lifetimes, even in this life, how long have we been making mistakes, pursuing mistaken paths, repeating the same mistaken actions again and again? How much energy have we expended to create the situation that we are in today? Because we are the ones who made it. If we want to undo that, we need energy powerful enough to crack open those defects of pride and anger and lust and greed and gluttony and fear and avarice and laziness and all of that that modifies our perception. That takes incredible energy to, to undo. It means that yoga is not something you can pursue five minutes a day or 10 minutes a week. It has to be a lifestyle, a way of being from moment to moment, a way of changing our perception, discarding harmful behaviors, adopting beneficial ones, learning to serve the greater good rather than our desires. And in that way, we're working with prana from moment to moment. In every moment, the prana of the body, the prana of the emotions, the prana of thoughts, the prana of will, which is the most significant of those. The prana of will, willpower. The willpower of the consciousness to dominate the animal body and the animal mind. You see in this image a drawing of the physical body with all of its incredible sophistication. We all have that. We have zero awareness of all the energy that's constantly transforming in us all the time. We have zero awareness of all the energy that's transforming in our emotional center and in our intellect all the time. But most of all, we ignore how if we were smart, we could harness all of that energy and use it for something profound, to transform ourselves, to stop being like everybody else in the world who's hypnotized by desire, by maya, to instead conquer that, to become something different. It's a matter of willpower to do it. If we can harness that prana, that is how pranayama actually begins. That word pranayama literally means to harness the wind or harness the life force. 
It means to harness all of the energy that we can access in a given moment. It doesn't just mean a breathing exercise. This is a behavioral transformation. It's to take yama and niyama, self-restraint and ethics, combined with relaxation of the body, heart, and mind, and unite them all under willpower, conscious will, who has its eyes on divinity, like that image of Radha at the beginning, to have our eyes towards something higher, greater, to become something greater. And that way we can harness all of the energies that we have. Now, to help us with that, we can practice what is named pranayama, a spiritual exercise. There are many varieties of pranayama, this type of practice. And we're going to learn one today. But the essential point of harnessing all this energy is to prepare ourselves for meditation, to extract the consciousness from the conditions that trap it to utilize all of our energy in order to take the consciousness out of conditions. This means to leave behind the physical body, to leave behind the physical world, to leave behind your name, your memories, your desires, your cravings, your fears, free of the senses, the mind, and the body. With that, as your goal, as your will, the pranayama harnesses all of your available energy to achieve that. Now, if you've studied yoga or pranayama with other traditions or in various books, you've probably heard that with the pranayama or a type of breathing exercise, the student should be visualizing bringing in energy from nature. So on the inhalation, they're imagining that they're drawing in energies from the outside world. There is some truth to that, obviously, because our body is always interacting with its environment. But that is the exoteric, public, superficial level of the explanation of pranayama. The true explanation of pranayama was not given publicly. The true explanation of pranayama is to harness the energy that is inside of us. Because there is incredible energy inside of us. If you think about that just for a moment, consider what happens if you take a single atom and you split it. Because we know what atomic bombs can do when we split an atom and liberate the energy that's in it, there's an incredible amount of energy in a single atom. Your whole being is made up of atoms in different levels. We are filled with incredible energy. And if you observe yourself and honest with yourself, you'll see that there's energy rising and falling in you every day, over which you have no real control, that pushes you to behave in different ways at different times, and you simply react. You get a surge of emotional energy that wants you to do a certain thing, and you do it. You get a surge of physical energy that wants you to do a certain thing, and you do it. You get a surge of mental energy, and you follow it without question. Pranayama is about questioning those impulses, controlling them, harnessing that energy, and redirecting it into more beneficial behaviors. Chiefly among those is, of course, the most powerful energy that flows within us. Now, we've talked generally about what prana is. Prana is everything. Prana is just the energy of all things. So everything that exists has prana. But you know well that everything has different energy with different capabilities, different capacities. It takes prana to breathe. It takes prana to think. 
It takes prana to feel. It takes prana to see, to hear. It takes prana to walk, to dream. But where in our lives do we touch the most powerful expression of prana? If we understand that prana is the basis of life and living, then it follows that its most profound expression is in its ability to create life. The sexual energy. That is why all of the yogis throughout history adopted brahmacharya in yama and niyama in the ethical phase of yoga. Brahmacharya means to restrain the sexual energy, to have continence, to hold it, to keep it, to preserve it. And through harnessing of the winds, pranayama, to transform it. You see here in these steps of yoga, yama is self-restraint from lust, Niyama is the precept. The chief one is brahmacharya, which is to hold that energy that wants to feed lust. Asana is to take a posture and relax. Pranayama is to take that wind energy, the life energy, the prana, and transform it. Observe this yogi in the image. This is a typical painting of how to perform a pranayama. Observe where the energy connects in the body, sexual energy, throat. You see those lines of energy moving through the body of the yogi? They begin in the sexual energy. That's the root of life. Life emerges into existence through sex. We are grown and developed through hormones. We are driven to behave through the endocrine system but we behave poorly because we are afflicted with lust. If we conquer lust, we liberate the energy that drives it. That's how you make a Buddha. That's how you make a master. You liberate the sexual energy from lust. That prana then becomes free and takes the consciousness directly to experience its true nature. We can either take the inferior physical ecstasy of the orgasm, or renounce that and exchange it for the superior ecstasies of the soul. Both are produced by the same energy. One is an animal behavior, the other divine. When we transmute the sexual energy through pranayama, we create what is called ohas. That word literally means light. Everybody wants light, spiritual light, but nobody wants to restrain the sexual energy. Everyone wants to remain an animal, serving desire, and take those lustful desires to heaven, but that can't happen. It's impossible. The beings who reside in the heavenly realms are free of lust. They have light, vitality, vigor, ability, splendor, strength, luster, power, energy because they are not controlled by lust. Instead, they control that. Their sexual energy enlightens them. You see that word, enlightenment? It has to do with ohas. And that's why in the Yoga Sutras, it says, by the establishment of continence, vigor is gained. Let us just take a moment to look at humanity in this era. Who has vigor? Nobody. People are desperately seeking everywhere for more energy, trying to change our diet, trying to get exercise, taking energy drinks, getting hooked on drugs and caffeine, any kind of substances, any kind of new class or workshop we can get to get more energy. People are taking pills and all kinds of chemicals to stimulate their sexual power because they have squandered it all because they are addicted to lust. But if you observe a yogi, someone who really practices yoga, they have bountiful energy. 
and are perfectly serene because they control the sexual force. That force becomes vigor, strength, light, liberation. That's why in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, I am the seed or virility in you. I, Krishna, am sex, which is not contrary to religion. Krishna, the great god of Hinduism, states explicitly in the Bhagavad Gita that Krishna, the force of Krishna, is the sexual energy. How could we possibly abuse that if we want to know what Krishna is? The Yoga Shastra says, expulsion of semen brings death. Preservation of semen gives life. Shiva Shamhita says, when the precious jewel of semen is mastered, anything on earth can be mastered. Through the grace of its preservation, one becomes as great as me, Shiva. Knowing this, the yogi must always preserve the semen. This is the ultimate yoga. Semen here doesn't refer to the physical substance. It refers to the energy, the prana. The sexual force that cycles through both masculine and feminine bodies. The gender is irrelevant. We all have that energy. It's what gives us life and the ability to create life. We can either create life externally, physically, through the expulsion of that force, or we can create life internally, spiritually, through its retention and transformation. This is the basis of yoga. This is the basis of learning to truly meditate. If you want to know why no one seems to know how to meditate, it's because they are not preserving the sexual energy. If you want to know why you go to all these yoga schools and kundalini yoga schools and you see so much bad behavior, addiction to lust, addiction to money, addiction to power, addiction to vanity, addiction to physical appearance, to maya, to illusion, it's because none of them are practicing yoga. They are not abiding by any ethics. They are not trying to liberate the consciousness from desire. They are in love with their desires. The outcome will be suffering, not liberation. The Bhagavad Gita and all the Shastras and Vedas and all the books of Hinduism and all the books of Buddhism and all the books of Christianity and Judaism all agree on this simple point the cause of suffering is desire. It's the first noble truth that the Buddha taught. And yet humanity refuses to hear it. And what is our strongest desire? It's the sexual desire. Now, let me point out that this does not mean that one has to renounce the sexual act. No. Krishna says, I am sex. Life is created through sexuality. The difference is to choose a divine sexuality, a non-lustful one, one that retains that energy, that trains it, that restores it, that liberates it from lust. That instead of embracing lust, expresses love, humility, charity, contentment. Sacrifice for others. Where that sexual act becomes prayer instead of animal craving. Where that sexual act becomes something that expresses the beauty of divinity, not the horrors of the underworld. Humanity on this planet nowadays only sees sex as something filthy. They cannot imagine sexuality can be something pure, divine, angelic, free of animal desire. It can, but not in the condition that we are in now. We have to liberate ourselves from that condition. So let me read you a passage about that. Mind, prana, and sexual energy are one. By controlling the mind, you can control prana and semen. By controlling prana, you can control the mind and semen. By controlling semen, you can control the mind and prana. If the sexual energy is controlled, and if it is made to flow upwards into the brain by pure thoughts and the practice of pranayama, the mind and the prana 
are automatically controlled. Mind, prana, sexual energy. We think of these as separate things. They are not. They are one thing. If you observe the priest who is supposed to be in chastity, but is secretly indulging in terrible behaviors, it's because he's not controlling his prana, his mind, or his sexual energy. He's a liar. He's a hypocrite. If we want to learn meditation, if we want to experience yoga, we need to understand this dynamic. Mind, prana, sexual energy. They are completely and 100% united. If your interest is in experiencing real meditation, samadhi, experiencing yoga, and you're restraining the sexual energy, you must also work with prana and restrain your mind. If you're allowing your mind to remain addicted to lust, to pornography, to masturbation, to looking at others lustfully, then you cannot control the prana or the sexual energy. They will all be disturbed. They are not distinct from each other. We cannot separate psychological work from sexuality. They're completely and 100% related. Even Freud knew that. They are completely 100% the same thing. So the next part of this passage says, when a man is excited by passion, the prana is set in motion. Then the whole body obeys the dictate of the mind just as a soldier obeys the command of his commander. The vital air or prana moves the internal sap or semen. The semen is put into motion. It falls downwards just as the clouds burst into rainwater, just as the fruits, flowers, and leaves of the trees drop down by the force of the blowing winds. If the virya, the sexual energy, is lost through orgasm, the prana gets unsteady. Prana is agitated. The man becomes nervous. Then the mind also cannot work properly. The man becomes fickle-minded. There is mental weakness. If the prana is rendered steady, the mind also becomes steady. If the virya, sexual energy, is steady, the mind also is steady. Virya, sexual energy, is the essence of life, thought, intelligence, and consciousness. Therefore, preserve this vital fluid very very carefully. Swami Shivananda said that, who is a great master of yoga. It's very clear. If our goal is to learn to meditate and we're struggling, we can look at this in our own lives. Are we really restraining our sexual energy, not just physically, but psychologically? How are we using our prana? These three are related. How are we using our energy? How are we using our mind? If our mind is weak, fickle, unsteady, it's because the energy in us is misdirected. It's not complicated. It simply takes awareness and willpower. So pranayama as a practice lets us harness the energy that moves in the body in order to train that energy to flow in a healthy way and restore our psychological equilibrium. So undoubtedly, if you've studied yoga, you've heard about the nadis, you've heard about kundalini, you've heard about the energy that flows through us. There are uncountable numbers of channels of energy that move through the body. But there are three that are significant that we need to know about. Shushumna is a very narrow, slender, non-physical channel in the center of the spinal column. On either side of it are two more channels, one solar and one lunar. They are called Ida and Pingala. They are also called Surya and Chandra. In the Bible, they are called Od and Obd, or Adam and Eve. This is the same symbol. So we have these channels of energy in us right now. There's energy that moves through them in us all the time. A 
according to our disposition and our psychological condition. But because of our psychological condition, these channels work very poorly, if at all, in some people. We can clean them, restore them, and rejuvenate them through a practice called pranayama, which is where we take the sexual energy and we direct it up through these channels and back and up and back. And through that willpower, which is concentration, and imagination, in combination with relaxation and brahmacharya, we clean those centers, those channels in us, which in turn cleans what are called chakras, which occur where these points meet. And the chakras are conduits that allow energy to move between dimensions. They are just like transformers of energy that move energy from one place to another. But they are the ones that allow us to perceive non-physical things, to experience non-physical images, non-physical sounds, to recall memories of ancient times. We don't remember any of that stuff because the chakras in us are inactive, dirty, or working improperly, and because these channels of energy in us are calcified, damaged from so much sexual misuse. So in one of the typical pranayamas, you use what's called alternate breathing, where you breathe in through one nostril, you hold the breath, and you exhale through the opposite nostril. Then you breathe in through that nostril, hold the breath, and exhale through the opposite nostril. And in this way, you're directing energy up one side, down the other, up one side, down the other. If you're preserving your sexual force, that energy is what will cycle through those channels and clean them. If you are not preserving your sexual energy, this practice will do nothing. Or worse, will awaken the negative, trapped, conditioned consciousness, and you will become a demon, which is very common nowadays. So the thing to know about these channels is that they are reversed in men and women. In women, the aspect related to the moon is connected with the right nostril and the left ovary. In men, it's the opposite. The lunar channel is related with the left nostril and the right testicle. And the reason you need to know this is that with certain types of pranayama, you will use certain mantras or prayers that, that correspond to the movements of those energies. So it's useful for you to know that. So this explanation and image shows a very typical type of pranayama. It's a very simple one. It's just alternate breathing. Through relaxation, one uses the thumb and index fingers to control the nostrils and inhales through a nostril, holds the breath, and exhales through the opposite. That's all this explains. We're going to do that practice today, so we'll go through it in detail. Here's what you need to know, though. If you want to really take advantage of the science of pranayamas in order to transform your spiritual life, there are prerequisites that you need to understand about how to use the practice. Obviously, the most important is you need to be restraining and transforming your sexual energy. Brahmacharya, the retention of the sexual force, is the power of pranayama. The sexual force is the strongest prana in you. If you are not retaining that energy, there's nothing to harness. If you're having the orgasm, you're wasting that energy. You're throwing it out and you're indulging in that little bit of pleasure. And you expel that energy and then it's it. That's gone. So you do a pranayama. It's like trying to take water out of an empty jar. There's nothing in there. When you retain the sexual energy, the, the jar of your sexual organs has that energy in it, the prana. And with the pranayama, you harness that. You transform it. Now remember what I said in the beginning. There is no such thing as matter. The physical body is an illusion. It is just condensed energy. 
The sexual matter is condensed energy. And you learn to restrain it and transform it. You simply take that energy into a new modality. There's nothing that complicated about it. It just takes willpower. But it's that energy that allows pranayama to be effective. This is why it's the first requirement to be able to practice pranayama successfully. The second is to be relaxed. We have observed people doing pranayama with a lot of tension in the physical body. Straining the physical body, all the muscles and very strong and tense. It's completely backwards to do that. For a pranayama to work, you need to be focused on the subtle energy, not the gross energy. You see, prana is in different modalities. Your physical body is prana, a gross form, a dense, heavy, obvious form of prana. That's not what we're trying to harness in a pranayama. In a pranayama, you're trying to harness the most subtle energy in the body, which is the sexual energy. You can't harness that when you're tense. Think about it. If your hand is very tense, can I give you a drink of water in my palm? No, there's no room. The hand has to be open, relaxed. Then I can cup water and hold it and hand it to you. Similarly, if a muscle is tense, energy is contained there, it's focused there, it's working there, it's engaged in that spot, and things cannot pass through there. But like when you're very tense, your body becomes like a rock. How can energy move through that? It's more difficult. When you're relaxed, more energy can move. So pranayama definitely affects this. When you're very relaxed, your pranayama will be more effective. Moreover, you should be very still. Again, the goal with pranayama is to harness very subtle energy. If you're paying attention to gross sensations, say for example, you're itching. And if you're there doing your pranayama exercise, but you keep scratching the itch, your attention is on that gross energy of the itch. That means you cannot pay attention to the subtle energy, prana, that you're trying to transform. So if your body is itching, ignore it. If your body is uncomfortable, relax it. Leave behind the physical aspect. Pranayama, you have to go deeper than the physical aspect. Third, pranayama should be quiet. This is emphasized throughout the scriptures and by Swami Shivananda, that the inhalation and the exhalation should be silent. Now, I know some people have learned pranayamas that are very vigorous and loud. That may be fine for them, but it's not fine to, when preparing for meditation. Remember, in meditation, you're going to escape the senses. So if in your pranayama you are identifying with the senses, you're doing the opposite of preparing for meditation. If in your pranayama you're breathing very vigorously and you're tensing your body and you're listening to yourself making all the sounds, you're not withdrawing from the physical aspect. You are identified with it. So Swami Shivananda states repeatedly in his teachings, as is stated in the scriptures, that the inhalation and the exhalation should be silent. In certain pranayamas, you use a mantra on the exhalation. Even then, that can be very quiet, where even you can't really hear it, because your attention should not be in the external world, it should be on the internal, forgetting the external. If you're making, if you have a tense body and you're making a lot of noises, you're going to remain identified with physicality, which is the opposite of the goal. Pranayama is a preparation for meditation. As I was ex explaining, the fourth is to withdraw from the senses and physicality. When you're practicing a pranayama, in the beginning, 
you have to learn the mechanism. So if you're doing the alternate breathing, you'll have to learn how to get your fingers to alternate the nostrils. So you get that rhythm and you figure it out. But your body will learn. And when your body learns, you no longer have to pay all attention to the fingers and how they're moving. It will do it on its own. Your attention should be on the prana, the energy. And let your body do what it needs to do. Don't pay attention to the body. Leave it behind. Withdraw from the senses. That's what prepares you for the second or the next stage of yoga, which is pratyahara. That literally means withdrawal. Fifth, you have to remain concentrated on what you're doing. If you're doing your pranayama exercise, but you're thinking about TV, you're wasting your time. If you're doing your pranayama exercise and you're thinking about what you have to do afterwards, you're wasting your time. With all spiritual practices, your attention must be on what you are doing, concentrated. And that relates to the next one, which is mindfulness, to not forget what you're doing. It's one thing to concentrate on it, it's another thing to make that continuous and to remain mindful. And seventh, visualize that energy and direct it with your willpower. With a pranayama exercise in all the different types, you visualize taking that energy, drawing it up the nadi that you're working with, holding it in a given place, directing it to a new place. So you're constantly visualizing a movement. That visualization needs to be an active visualization, not passive. It needs to be something that you are actively imagining. That power of imagination is really significant. It's very important for the later stages of meditation. It's important to develop it through pranayama. You're harnessing that energy and using imagination to direct it. And finally, pray. Many people learn pranayama and they do it as a mechanical exercise. The same way they do their push-ups and pull-ups and downward dog and whatever else they do. Listen, prana is a living thing. It is not a mechanical thing. Prana is the active energy of God. It is intelligence in nature. Prana is Shakti, the Divine Mother. She is not a force to be fooled or toyed with. She is a living intelligence in all things. So when you're performing a pranayama, you are invoking the presence of the Divine Mother. That's not a game. That's not something you do to get powers or to impress others. It's something you do for the benefit of your soul. So the prayer is a prayerful attitude when you perform this exercise. You're doing something sacred, and it should be treated as such with a lot of reverence. So those are the basic requirements to practice pranayama. And of course, we have to be persistent and patient. You won't get results from pranayama after 10 minutes or a few days. The fruit of pranayama is like the fruit of a fruit tree. It takes time. It has to be carefully nurtured, constantly attended to. And gradually, little by little, all of a sudden you realize you have this beautiful, flowering, fragrant thing that you have grown inside of you. And it's astonishing. And you want to share it with everyone. So to reach that, you need persistence and patience. So if you're following along with the course, the new exercise, of course, is to begin practicing daily pranayama. So do you have any questions about today's lecture? Um, in the context of uh, stilling the mind, I know uh, a 
while ago we did the practice of the concentration on the inhale. Um, and at that time, you heard us to just, you know, thoughts come in. I mean, you see them, but you focus on what you're concentrating on, which is the breath. So, how does, I guess, how does that work, you know, in daily life when it comes to you strengthening the mind? In a way where you're not, I guess, rejecting the information that whatever that thought is, is presenting, but you're still in the present moment. You know? It's to do what you just said, to observe it without reacting, without avoiding it or indulging in it, but to observe it as a fact. So you have to be sort of a detective, you know, who's observing the actions of a criminal, and you're gathering information about what that criminal's up to. How does it think? How does it feel? What does it do? What does it want? And you just make your notes, and you observe it. You get all the facts. Later on, you'll put all those facts together and work on it. Yeah. But the initial phase is, is the gathering of information. Well, if that, I mean, if that thought is, I guess, detrimental to yourself or others, then you're just, and you allow that thought to exist, then what... Well, if, if in the instant of observing that thought, you recognize that it's harmful, you've already started to disempower it. If you choose to follow it and indulge in it, then you know, you're going to make things worse. But that initial recognition is a comprehension. You start to understand, hey, this is no good. And if you're following the consciousness, you will naturally not act on it. You will naturally just continue on with your activities and do what you need to do and not let those thoughts afflict you anymore. Yeah. Let me note about this that the pranayama has a very strong impact on observation of the mind. And the reason that we practice pranayama at this phase of practice is that the pranayama, by harnessing energy, actually acts as a suction pump. Remember I explained from the quote that the mind, the prana, and the sexual energy are all one. They're all united. So if our goal is to meditate, we practice a pranayama first. The reason is, when you harness that energy and you're directing it throughout your organism, it actually clears the mind. One, because you're not engaged in thought. You're concentrating and you're observing what you're doing and you're visualizing that practice. You're prayerful. You're moving energy around. You're not engaged in the mind. But that energy, the sexual energy, is mind. It is prana. It acts like a pump, affecting the psychology, the state of your heart, the state of your mind, the state of your body, and calming everything, making it serene. And you'll experience that if you're conserving your energy, if you're relaxed, if you're concentrated, you're visualizing, you will experience that effect. It's very strong. On that note, if you're in your daily life and you find that you're becoming very unstable, very agitated, you can do pranayama right then. You can just relax, adopt that prayerful attitude, breathe, breathe, relax, direct that energy around, and you'll find that your mind and body and heart will calm down by using energy in that way. So it can help, especially with very afflictive thoughts that won't leave you alone. To learn more about what you learned in this lecture, we invite you to explore the books published by Gloria and Publishing, available from booksellers worldwide. You may also be interested in online courses or upcoming retreats, all of which you can learn about at GnosticTeachings.org. All of this has been made possible by the financial support of listeners like you. Will you help others to benefit from this knowledge? Most spiritual schools recommend a donation of $10 to $20 per lecture. Every donation helps. Make a donation now at GnosticTeachings.org. Thank you. May all beings be happy. Yeah,